You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. And welcome to Spookulative Evolution. Hello, David. My armor is like tenfold shields. <laughs> My teeth are swords, Will. <laughs> and hello, listeners. Welcome to episode three of Spooky 2023. Dragons? Well, we are still talking about dragons, and this time, wyverns or wyverns, whichever way you want to say it. Yeah, we're, we're open to all possibilities. Yeah. This is our series where we take a look at monsters of various kinds and say, what if they evolved on Earth? How would we get something that looked like this creature, behaved like it, had the stories that people tell about it what, under the rules of natural selection? What pressures might lead them to evolve those features and where would their ancestry lie? Exactly. We've been doing dragons this year. We've done European dragons. We've done East Asian dragons. And now we're kind of returning to European dragons for wyverns, which is a particular kind of European dragon. This is, of course, just for fun. We've been releasing these every Saturday, and we will continue to here in October. And then we have our live stream next month, November 11th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. So check the description for our website, and you can get all the details there. While we're releasing this series and sharing our thoughts on these topics, feel free to join us on Discord and social media to share your own thoughts. So, wyverns... What's a wyvern? Wyverns are two-winged two-legged dragons right so we when we did european dragons mm -hmm. we talked about a lot of diversity of dragons who have front limbs back limbs and wings yes the six limb dragon design that is the classic versus a knight dragon design that you will typically see portrayed so to relate things back to pokemon as i always do mm -hmm. the european dragon that we talked about is your charizard the east asian dragon is your rayquaza wyverns are your noivern yep precisely <laughs> and typically you will hear them defined as four-legged or two-legged dragons, where they're not including the wings among the limbs. Mm -hmm. They have wings, and then they have four legs or two legs. Now, otherwise, they have basically the same description as your average European dragon, often long-necked, often long-tailed, horned, toothed, scaled, armored, clawed, all those things. The wings are typically bat wings. This is another extremely popular form of dragon, especially recently in movies. Yeah, modern pop culture really likes wyverns. They have very much latched onto this being the modern form of dragon. We still see the you know classic European dragon, but it feels like a lot of your big ticket movies, big ticket dragons, where a lot of money went into producing them, and yes, and they are hoping for blockbusters. It is going to be a wyvern. Yeah, your Game of Thrones dragons were this style. Uh, Smaug. Yep. In the Hobbit movies, that the quote that I said at the beginning of the mm -hmm. episode is from Smaug. I'm aware, Tolkienites, that the version of the quote I used is from the book. Yes. Where it in the movie is when he's a wyvern. I know, I did it anyway. Yep. But that version of Smaug is this wyvern body shape. And in fairness, in the book description, they never specify that Smaug isn't a wyvern. Yeah, a lot of older <laughs> depictions of Smaug associated with the book are the four-legged plus wings yes. version. Uh, the movie version, the Peter Jackson movie version, is very wyvern-esque. Extremely. There are plenty of descriptions of the wyvern body design. We talked about some of them in the European Dragons episode. Some of the monsters birthed from Tiamat, the goddess of monsters from Mesopotamian mythology, included two-legged winged serpents like Bashmu. And so there have been dragons taking on that body shape since the beginning of European Dragons. There are also other descriptions of dragons that are famous and similar to this. Marco Polo is often quoted for describing dragons when he went exploring in the 13th century and described two-legged serpents with sharp teeth in China that were probably crocodiles or alligators. Sure. But... He was just not good at counting. Yep. Because if they... <laughs> and I was picturing maybe if they only came partway out of the water. Yeah, that so would So you just sense. saw a long reptile with two <laughs> legs. So like... Serpentine dragons with just a pair of legs have been around for quite some time, but most examples you will see are in heraldry, so like shields and banners in medieval Europe. Yeah, a lot of European, like families, houses, mm -hmm. kingdoms have the wyvern as like their symbol. Exactly. And, you know, all sorts of animals got used in these. Wyverns became very, very common in heraldry, often depicted standing on the two legs with a long tail coming up. 
and the wings spread over its back. So basically standing like a bird Mm -hmm. with its wings up. Sometimes depicted balanced on the tail with the claws and wings up in the air. Oh, yeah. And so kind of either that it was supposed to be flying or was actually balanced up on its tail like a kangaroo mid-kick. It isn't until the 1300s, so 1312 is the earliest use of the term wiver, W-Y-V-E-R, and used in association with British heraldry. There are a couple of different ideas as to where this term came from. One I found was that it came from the Middle English wyver, which likely came from the Anglo-French wyver or, or weaver, which is W-I-V-R-E, which likely originated from the Latin vipera, which was for viper. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. So likely still having a serpentine origin, which, as we mentioned, is extremely common in European dragons that most of them started out either looking like snakes, you know, described as big snakes, or called serpents. Yeah, I'm reeling from the suggestion that the word wyvern is etymologically related to the word viper. Right? That, yeah, I see it. Yep. Oh, cool. Uh-huh. The other one I found, now this sounded like it was suggested by at least a scholar, but may okay. not be a widely held one, that it came from a different meaning of wiver, which was for a light javelin, named that because of a javelin's resemblance to snakes, a long skinny body with a arrow shaped head and that these terms got con- combined these concepts i should say got combined into the idea of a flying snake yeah a you dangerous th- flying object. exactly you yeah. throw the javelin it's a flying snake it comes from a word similar to it interesting it wasn't until the next century that the term dragon appears and this is when we start seeing the distinction between four-legged as a dragon two-legged as a wyvern yes a distinction that in the modern age of pop culture wyverns Lots of nerds have really clung to. Yes, indeed. (laughs) And this distinction seems to have shown up in the 16th century. And there are even like articles of people specifying like, you know, texts and documents about heraldry and about, you know, the customs and practices. Official scholars. I'm actually, Mm -hmm. that's a wyvern. Yeah, because there there were rules for how you represent your house, how you distinguish between them, how you describe them. There are a couple of quotes that I saw from the 1600s. One saying that wyverns, this time W-I-V-E-R-N-E, which I just like noting that it's spelled differently almost every time Mm -hmm. it pops up in a new century. Gone through many changes in many many languages. This one said that they partake of a fowl in the wings and leg, so bird-like in wings and legs, sure, and serpent in the tail. Another one specifying it hath but two legs. So like, this is when that distinction showed up. And since then, has been defined differently in heraldic dragons, mostly, though, in English, Scottish, and Irish heraldry. Most other countries don't distinguish. It's just a two-legged or four-legged dragon. Interesting. Some still will use the term wyvern, but it's just, they're just dragons. Right, not as specific in its usage. So Mm. it's really just in those countries' history that that became such an important thing. Otherwise, it's just a two-legged dragon. You know, so it is, it's one of those where it is a fun fact but also, like, we can all we can all take it a little bit easy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. They're all dragons. They're we, all dragons. We love all of it's them. It's fun to know the term. Uh, they are different enough that we are giving them their yes, own episode. But no need to correct anyone, I think, you know? <laughs> uh, there are some countries I found that had tales of wyverns more often than dragon listed in their stories. Uh, Catalan dragons, so Catalan in the northern uh, regions of Spain, would have both four-legged and two-legged dragons but they would call the two-legged ones wyverns and there were some stories and specific descriptions that leaned that way a bit more there was another version of dragons in their stories called vibra for viper and once again that connection to wyvern that were two-winged two-clawed dragons with eagle's beaks sometimes with women's features Hmm. so sometimes they were more kind of like harpy-esque in in their description they also had a story of one of these female wyverns when it battled St. George. It even spawned a, a holiday that was each time retelling that story and reenacting it. And the people of the town would root for either the wyvern or St. George. <laughs> I know who I'd root for. Absolutely, yeah. And the wyvern had a name. It was a coca. And sometimes they'll even call it St. Coca and St. George. Hmm. So it's it, they have a very prominent wyvern in their stories. I also found that Italian dragons were more often wyverns, it seems. 
still filling the roles of dragons in a lot of other European stories. Typically evil, being slain by heroes, associating with demons, all sorts of stuff like that. They have a legend of St. George and the Wyvern, as well as other bishops and saints fighting Wyverns. That is a very common trope of holy people defeating a Wyvern and showing their, their might over evil. They also had a famous named Wyvern, Thyrus, which also was unfortunately killed by a young brave knight, but is on the town's coat of arms. So like, there are some instances where Wyverns were the go-to dragon for areas and groups of people and regions, but most often the Wyvern body plan is just kind of mixed in with other dragons. Right, a style of dragon. Yeah. It's just when you'll hear descriptions of Greek dragons, sometimes they have two legs. They're not specified to be wyverns because often that was before that term existed. But that body plan has been around for a very long time. In more recent centuries, as in like you know, the last five centuries, they have become their own distinct thing and have had areas where they were the dragon used in those stories. And that mostly wraps up our, our deep history, our history from like the Middle Ages for wyverns since... Otherwise, it's pretty much the same as European dragons. There's also not any unique fossil inspirations for them compared to just dragons in general. Except that nowadays, you will often find when that comes up, that we have found bat-winged, <laughs> two-legged <laughs> dinosaurs in the group called Scansoriopterigids. That means climbing wings. This is a group of dinosaurs that had members with bat-like membrane wings on their front limbs. They were feathered like a lot of other winged dinosaurs, but they hadn't formed fully feathered wings from what we can tell from the ones who have these special wings that have elongated fingers, membranes between them. Some have an extra bone coming off the wrist to form a more expanded, potentially gliding surface. We don't think they could likely fly fly, but this was a group mostly known from China, I believe, that had what at a glance you would call a wyvern that had bat-like wings on their front limbs and two legs. So you'll see these come up very often in modern discussions of dragon evolution or dragon anatomy or dragon features in that there mm -hmm. was a group who matches our description of a wyvern pretty close. Right. They were very small. You know, most of them were like less than 10 inches uh, long, so they were not big wyverns. <laughs> they were tiny little bird-sized wyverns. But it felt amiss to not mention them in a discussion of wyverns. Yeah. Well, and it's a very tempting thing. As we mentioned in the previous episodes, people are often tempted to look to real life things for either parallels or sources of inspiration. Like we discussed in the previous episodes, pointing at dinosaur fossils and saying that that is where the idea that dragons came from is highly speculative. And indeed, these animals were only documented scientifically in the last several years. Yes, they're very recent to science. But there are plenty of accounts, like we've talked about, of people having mythological creatures and then pointing at fossils and going, aha, that's the thing that from our mythology that those line up. And it's always very fun when we discover something in the fossil record and go, that, that actually has a lot in common with these mythological creatures and isn't that cool. Yes, it's, it's always fun when we can draw connections between some, you know, a fantasy thing we like and going, actually, there is something similar to it. There's a little bit of truth in the real world that brings that fantasy a little bit to life. And yeah. that's always fun. But past that, most of the like mythos of Wyverns really seems to have come from more recent media and, and stories of them. They've become more and more popular over time and have kind of gained their own flavor and characteristics, mostly through film and games and modern media. We mentioned a number of movies that you find them in. A lot of movies now just have kind of default to Wyverns as their dragons. Even before Smog, the fell beasts that the Nazgul rode in Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. were also a Wyvern body design. There are some old examples like Ghidorah from the Godzilla movies. Mm -hmm. That's technically, it's a three-headed Wyvern, which is Odd, but they never specify how many heads a wyvern's supposed to have. Sure. <laughs> right? <laughs> that the legs are the important yes. part. The heads, they could do whatever. Some of the dragons and how to train your dragon. Like, wyverns have shown up over and over again. The Skyrim dragons. Like, yep. Some of the the big deal dragon stuff in recent years. Yep. Like I said before, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. The, 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 the TV series, those dragons are wyverns. There are tons of examples. 
And this has become just kind of the go-to dragon for many, especially live action dragons. Yeah. Like very often animated dragons will still be four-legged. Kids dragons can have six limbs, but there seems to have been some decision at some point that if you want to have a live action dragon and people take it seriously, it needs to be a wyvern. There's never been stated exactly why this is. Right, this has become the trend. Yes. I would suspect that a big part of it is that, like we mentioned with European dragons, getting six limbs in a vertebrate is very, very difficult, if not impossible, with some with simple explanations. Yeah, well, and even if our Hollywood and TV producers aren't thinking, wow, how did it evolve this way? Wyverns are a body shape that we have real life animals that exactly. look like that. Yes. Which means that... Not only can it be a bit more familiar to us, like that's basically just the shape of a bird, yep. but also for animators, it means that they have an easier time pulling inspiration from real world animals. So it's a much more grounded shape of dragon that just makes it easier to connect on both the production and the audience side. Yes. And being grounded is something that I've heard people mention has become more and more of a, a feature of films in recent years that that's drives many styles in films that having a bit more grounded and this is your more grounded dragon mm. in that yeah we have animals who are this body plan now because of that it means a lot of our perceptions of what a wyvern is like have come from these sources and i went in as deep a dive as i could to try to find you know the sources and the earliest showing ups of wyverns and stuff and I'm sure there might be ones I've missed. So if you're a film history person or anything, and or <laughs> an art history person, you go, actually, there is an earlier. Please let me know. I'd be fascinated to find out. There have been multiple times where wyverns have been described in more detail. Probably one of the, the easiest ones for finding that description is there are Dungeons and Dragons wyverns yes. that are distinctly defined separate from dragons. True dragons have four legs, two wings, and are the big elemental dragons. Wyverns have two legs, two wings and are described as being distantly related to dragons. Dragon-esque, but not dragons. These also are typically running around on their two legs, more like a theropod dinosaur yep. with bat-like wings on the front limbs. They often also have a scorpion tail, basically. Yeah, they have a stinger at the end. Mm -hmm. Which sometimes is described in old wyverns of them having a sharp tail, mm -hmm. which is... Also common in dragons in general, having that arrow-headed spiked tail. Yep. And in D&D, &D, they are venomous. Yes. And here they are full-on stinger tail. Like, full-on. Yes. Some some of the old art is just them with a scorpion tail, basically, on the back. Oh, yeah. It just full-on arched over the back and then wyvern body. That is not a super common thing. In, like, that is a D&D &D wyvern thing. Yeah. And I, I mentioned that just because I've seen that discussion come up before. of being like, well, wyverns often have a stinging tail. In D&D. &D, yes. And a couple of other things, but typically that's not something I found to be a common occurrence with them. The wyvern we tend to think of nowadays and tend to see most often is not running around on two legs, but walking on all four limbs. Yeah. Much more akin to a bat. Yes. And this is another thing that has come about with this increased understanding of how modern animals work. Yes. It's been super cool to see like, yeah. Researchers have gotten better understandings about how bats move around, about how pterosaurs moved around. I don't think that it is a coincidence that the age of four-limbed walking wyverns in movies has come after Jurassic Park 3 gave us four-limbed walking pterosaurs, and that image became popular. And it definitely does seem to link to pterosaurs. From what I could find, and this is where if you know something I don't, I, <laughs> I looked through as many lists of dragon movies as I could without just scrolling through and clicking on literally every single one that Wikipedia ha said had a dragon in it. One of the earliest films to portray a wyvern and especially portray it in the way we see them nowadays is Dragon Slayer from 1981, mm. which is one of like, it's a cult classic dragon film. It is considered one of the best portrayals of a dragon on film ever. With good reason, they spent a quarter of the film's budget on the dragon. This dragon, of course, being Vermithrax Pejorative, the 400-year-old terrible dragon that is terrorizing the village and eating maidens, crawled like a bat, hmm. and moved basically like every movie wyvern since then. Interesting. So way before Jurassic Park 3, mm -hmm. so I, I was even underestimating. But according to interviews with the creators, it was inspired by Ramphorhynchus. 
by oh, pterosaurs. Interesting. By the scientific knowledge that actually they probably walked on all fours. That was what inspired them to put them down on all fours and base their movements off of real world animals. Cool. This is where it seems basically every movement from wyverns came from. I didn't find anything earlier than this. And if you haven't seen Dragon Slayer before, I'd recommend it. It is a it's it's a very very it's a cult classic type movie. It's kind of odd. It's got a, its own flavor. It's slow, slow, slow at parts. Look up YouTube Dragon Slayer, <laughs> uh, Vermithrax or Dragon Scene, but it will show you the the scenes with the dragon. And you know it's dated, but it looks basically like smog. Like we have not updated. <laughs> the way we portray a wyvern moving and walking around since then. It's just Dragon Slayer. So inspired by pterosaur walking, inspired by those movements we got to now that all our wyverns are quadrupedal, usually there's still every now and then you'll get bipedal ones. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some of those in, drag in How to Train Your Dragon that were running around more like a, a dinosaur than crawling on all fours. And there have been dragon movies since then that didn't do that for him. Uh, one movie, Dragon World, had a bipedal wyvern, which is 1994. But that movie really gave us our modern depiction of wyverns. So if, you, if you're if you still you know wondering what I'm describing, picture the Game of Thrones dragons or Smog. That's what Dragon Slayer did. That's where they got it from, 100%. The next movie to add to wyvern lore was Reign of Fire. Mm -hmm. At least add to it in a way that has stayed on. Yeah. Reign of Fire in 2002 was the movie that introduced the concept of two sacks in the dragon's throat that sprayed out a chemical and a catalyst, and when mixed together in oxygen, created their fire. And this has been how a lot of dragons breathe fire since then, or at least implied that's what they're doing in the fact that Game of Thrones dragons have two jets that come out from either side of their mouth. Mm -hmm. Other dragons have done that. Even when Dr Game of Thrones stopped doing that, because I watched a scene from House of the Dragon, where they show the fire coming from inside the throat, they still give them the two little orifices hmm. on either side of the mouth. Even though you're showing us blatantly that the fire doesn't come from there, huh. you still are alluding back to Reign of Fire. So Reign of Fire has kind of become the go-to biological explanation for fire in modern movies and are also some of just the most beautiful, awesome looking movie dragons you could ever ask. Rain of fire dragons are awesome. I They're so cool. <laughs> and they, that was another thing noted that they used cutting edge graphics to portray the dragons in a way that made them look so realistic mm -hmm. based off of Disney's dinosaur so that you actually had scales, not just scale texture. Yeah. It was actually scaled skin moving over muscle so they captured them, and they very actively tried to make them a bit more proportioned with wings long enough to support a big body mm -hmm. and a mind for how would this animal actually have to be shaped to behave the way we want it to behave. So yet another movie that said, all right, but what if we go real into the biology and has stuck around? And since then, in between those, there have been plenty of other examples of these kinds of dragons and flavors of these showing up over and over. But I wanted to use this as a transition into talking about fire breath. Because we didn't go into that too much in European Dragon. Because A, breathing fire is not a thing animals do. But also, a lot of those dragons didn't always breathe fire. Many of them were venomous or spitting toxins or poison. So we kind of we're able to skirt around full-on fire breath. But there have been examples and books and movies that have tried to explain fire breath with biological answers, or at least close to reasonable biological answers. The most famous one nowadays is Reign of Fire with the two glands, based off of inspired by the bombardier beetle, which has its two chemicals, which is hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone, I think, or hydroquinone. And when those mix... At the tip of the abdomen, they chemically react and heat up to almost the boiling point of water and are used as a defensive tool against predators and ants and so forth, able to kill smaller insects while the beetle can survive those temperatures and pulses it so that it's not just burning itself. This is by far the one I see referenced back to most often nowadays when people are like, well, actually, this is how dragons could breathe fire. Look at Reign of Fire. Look at the Bombardier Beetle. 
But before that film and before we, the, the bombardier beetle was such a feature in documentaries nowadays, there were previous attempts. One of the earliest ones I found was from the books, The Dragon Riders of Pern, which is a very, very famous series of books about dragons on another world with a whole alien biology. But dragons there are the, they're the four-legged European dragons, but they do have an anatomy for breathing fire. And here it was that they would choose, chew up Firestone, which was phosphine-bearing rock, and it would react with their stomach acid in a second crop area, a second stomach that they called it, forming gases that they could then exhale and would ignite when they came in contact with the air, giving them their flame. It also noted that whenever they had exhausted the stone, they had to regurgitate it or else it would become toxic in their belly because they couldn't actually digest the rock. And this, it seems, led to a common idea of gaseous fire, where we have the chemical fire and rain of fire. A lot of the older explanations were that they were forming gas in their body somehow. Flight of Dragons, which was a book and then eventually an animated movie that was inspired by the book, suggested a similar process. The book version was saying that stomach acid dissolved parts of their bone that were rapidly growing and that this would create hydrogen, this was also how they explained their flight in that they would have air sacs inside the body that would allow them to expand and basically become a dragon blimp and that the wings were just for steering and movement, not for actual lift. And that expelling the gas was both how they landed and how they could breathe fire. In the book, they also said that this was the potential reason that if dragons had existed, there wouldn't be fossil evidence because the strong acid would eat the skeletons before they could preserve. <laughs> The book was an attempt to try to find reasonable explanations to all the stories of dragons. The film did a bit better job of pulling everything together. They went back to the stone that they have to grind up limestone, white fire rock, as it's described, and keep it in a craw and hold it there. They would also eat diamonds and gemstones to grind up the stone in their craw. The calcium from the limestone, once it was grinded up, would react with stomach acid, producing hydrogen. The hydrogen could then be stored in air sacs in the bones and muscle that can be expanded to allow them to get more lift and fly. And then they would expel the hydrogen when they wanted to land. And they had an organ in the mouth called Thor's thimble that was an electrical organ that would spark the gas to allow them to breathe fire. The movie Dragon World did a very similar concept, except they went with the acid dissolving the bones and that they would chew metal and that's what would give them the spark to breathe fire. And that's also might be why they collected metal to get those precious metals needed. I think they said platinum specifically, which is the other common way to go. The documentary Dragons, a fantasy made real, also went with this gaseous collecting in the body mm -hmm. uh, way of breathing fire when they did their dragons. They also did wyverns as their prehistoric dragon, and it was a big theropod dragon. So this is the version that shows up with explanation more often, but since Reign of Fire, basically every version of dragons that it tries to give some slight explanation, does the two jets from the mouth, at least implying that it's mixing the chemicals or maybe just wanting to look cool like Rain of Fire because Rain of Fire looked very cool. <laughs> so with that, that gives kind of our background to Wyverns. We can start moving into how we will evolve our, wither our Wyvern. But first, our magic disclaimer. As always, when we're dealing with monsters, they often have capabilities that are not possible with normal biology and under the physics of our real world and that there would be no way to evolve them via natural selection. So we have to kind of play it fast and loose with all of those. Most of the things this would apply to with a wyvern are the same things for the European dragon. Mm -hmm. But luckily we are down a pair of limbs. <laughs> so we're good there. And we have some proposed explanations for fire that we can at least look at and see if they're actually reasonable. <laughs> so let's evolve a wyvern. So as you mentioned, unlike with the European dragon body shape, the wyvern body shape get, puts us in a very convenient position. Yep. That we already have real world animals that have that shape. And in fact, we mentioned all of them Yep. in that description. That all flying vertebrates are wyverns in yes. that their front limbs are wings and their back legs are legs. <laughs> Birds, bats, and pterosaurs all develop that shape of adapting the front limbs into wings. Yes. In birds, they're typically 
feathered. Mm-hmm. So bats and pterosaurs both have that membrane structure. In bats, it's between the long fingers. In pterosaurs, it's supported by one long finger, and then the membrane stretches to the body. In birds, the flight surface is usually mainly made up of feathers. Yes. Although, as you pointed out earlier, there are near-bird theropods that did have membranous gliding surfaces coming off of their front limbs. So, uh, as is not always the case with Spooky, our cup kind of overfloweth with options. Yeah, we'll have to pick Mm -hmm. where do we want our wyverns to fall within this existing diversity i think those groups are kind of the obvious oh, yeah. choices well it's kind of like to why, go for why why go to the the trouble of picking another group and having to get them to wings first right <laughs> when we already have three major groups that can that are, have already done that so i guess it maybe the next step could be what are the other features of a wyvern and yeah. how which of these groups might get us to there or be more likely to display those features. Yeah. One that sticks out in my mind is the long tail. I was about to say, long tail is something that ni- none of those typically have, <laughs> especially <laughs> so, not the modern versions. In pterosaurs, uh, early pterosaurs, mm-hmm. the one, one sort of half of pterosaur diversity, as it were, have long tails. Yeah. Rampharynchus and a lot of other early pterosaurs do have those long tails. Bats tend to not, Mm -hmm. and birds tend to not today. Yes. Although early birds like Archaeopteryx and those near bird theropods like Ichi and the the Scansoriopterygians and things like that did have long reptilian tails. Yeah, they still had the bony tails. And bats today still have their tail. It's just typically short. You Mm -hmm. have some that are like the free-tailed bats and long-tailed bats that have more notable tails, but they're still very tiny. Right. It's not that snaky long mm-hmm. reptile tail. But you could you could definitely get there with them. Sure. The early pterosaurs also have longer tails, which were also fairly thin. Mm-hmm. So like our beefiest tails would come from the early birds or, or dinosaurs. For sure. Mm-hmm. Wyverns also are commonly depicted, especially in modern stuff, with claws on the wings. Yes. Uh, which is something that you get uh, notably in pterosaurs. Yep, yep. Because they're only using one finger to support the wing, so the other fingers are all this hand that they are that they can still use, that they can still use for walking and such. Which is kind of a neat fact when it comes to wyverns, is that it's going through them, they have often very different numbers of claws on the wing for walking. Hmm. Uh, some having multiple. A lot of the old heraldries just had the one because they were inspired by bat wings, which have the one digit, the thumb there, acting as that claw. Others will have a couple, like I think Vermithrax had a, a couple of digits. It's also fun to note that a lot of times movies will put the right number of digits in the wing so that there mm-hmm. is a total of five. Game of Thrones just has the one. Uh, so it's it seemed they kind of play fast and loose with how much of the hand became the wing and how much of it remained as digits. And even a lot of early birds and some modern birds Mm -hmm. still get claws at the end of their fingers on their wings. Yep, yep. So all three can give us clawed wings pretty easily. I find myself leaning towards pterosaurs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And here's why. Number one, they give us the crawling around. Yes. That sort of modern wyvern walking on all fours. But also... As we've discussed in previous episodes, one of the challenges that birds run into with flight and weight distribution is that they have those big, strong back legs yep. that add extra weight and is likely one of the reasons why birds have never gotten quite as big as pterosaurs have. Yep. Whereas pterosaurs are concentrating all that muscle up front, their back legs are relatively small and, I want to say weak, but they're, they're not the big beefy drumsticks that you get with birds. And that different body proportion is likely part of what allowed pterosaurs to get to the enormous sizes that they did. Mm -hmm. So pterosaurs seems our best option if we want to get truly big wyverns that also can actually fly. I agree. Now, don't get me wrong. The visual of a giant bat dragon is very nice in my head with a big, long, furry tail. Absolutely. I very much 
want that. If someone decides they want to draw that just because, <laughs> I won't say well, no. And I there there's no reason why we couldn't have it be yeah. an offshoot of yeah, bats yeah. that developed more of that. You know, bats, in theory, would be able to get big with that body proportion yeah. the same way pterosaurs if did. They, if they start developing the same kind of... Uh, uh, musculature that it seems pterosaurs were using for taking off while huge pterosaurs do nicely give us an avenue for long necks long Mm -hmm. tails the biggest pterosaurs didn't have long tails nope and they tended uh they were often toothless yep uh they did not have big teeth but if we're playing around with our evolutionary history yeah if we start with one of the tooth lineages yeah and we say all right well you're one of the early ones that had tails went and got big. The other thing that pterosaurs are very nice for, which is the another thing that I think is often easy to forget, in that typically dragons are horned. Ah, uh, that's true. And pterosaurs are great at head display. That is very true. They are really good at making horns and crests and big display structures on the back of the head, which both of the other groups tend not to do. That is true. So pterosaurs have this great diversity. These are our flying reptiles of the Mesozoic, your pteranodons and pterodactyls and such. Earlier groups of pterosaurs were typically your smaller ones like Ramphorhynchus mm-hmm. with the long tails. Later ones had this huge diversity of big pteranodons and quetzalcoatluses. And yeah, tons of them have these big fancy head crests. I do like that angle with yeah. head ornamentation, which is a thing that is common among... Archosaurs. Yes. Outside of birds. Absolutely. And I have birds do it, but not in quite that same way. Yeah, typically not with bony bits as yeah, often. But I could see pterosaurs with those bony structures on their heads. Yep, yep. And we could either start with the, the toothed early ones like Rampharynchus or Dimorphodon. Like, but Dimorphodon just has like a, a short a, snouted toothy d- yeah, face a, a already. Wyvern face. Yep. <laughs> it basically is a wyvern, just a bald. Yep. Or we could go with one of the bigger ones that's more often crest and even if they don't have teeth we could give them the serrated bills have some, been something oh, that well, show up with toothless animals all the time it could be something like the pelagornithids mm-hmm. the pseudo toothed mm-hmm. birds that developed bony spokes basically along the beak exactly or beaky spokes that aren't teeth but serve the function of teeth are gonna feel like teeth when they bite you yep <laughs> <laughs> and it, we can also have an early member of pterosaurs that kept the tail and the teeth Mm -hmm. and then evolved all these convergent structures similar to your bigger crested pterosaurs later on which is the way i think i am leaning because we already have the tail we already have the teeth we would just have to be assuming convergence with the head crest and bigger sizes and and posture i think a thought that comes to my mind i like that i Mm -hmm. like the idea this is a pterosaur one thing that comes to mind for me is as we mentioned Long tails are not a thing that tends to stick around in flying lineages, especially ones that become large or very uh, widespread. Yeah, for whatever reason, they just don't seem to be a a key feature when you're at that size. So I'm wondering if if it would be beneficial to have a secondary function of that tail Mm -hmm. that supports the selective pressure for it to stick around, even if it's kind of in the way while you're flying. Yes. And obviously there are always display structures to go with, but uh, right there in the mythology, uh, we have wyverns with stingers. Yeah, a a tail defense would be pretty, that would be pretty, pretty interesting. It would be a little bit weird. Yes. That's a, you know, we don't see that very often in flying groups. We do have groups that use their tails for defense. Archosaurs in particular, there are dinosaurs that do that. Crocodilians today uh, will use their tails to whack at stuff. The, I, I had a thought, we might not go with this, mm-hmm. but the thought of a structure that came first mm-hmm. that predisposed something specialized on the tail. A lot of those early pterosaurs were arboreal. Yep, yep. And now I have an image of my head of them having this tail structure that they would use like an eye eye. Oh, yeah. To like tap on wood and then like probe into holes and stuff to get insects and stuff out. Oh, or, or could it be like, prehensile for perching on a limb oh yeah yeah like, like a, a like a monkey yeah. you've got this or a chameleon i guess is a closer yeah, relative yeah, yeah. it's to, there to help out with not falling off yeah and i could you know that could still be a feeding thing of you fly up per you know grab onto the tree and then anchor yourself with your tail and now you can get your limbs and face involved in 
you know, going for whatever you're going for. Mm -hmm. Uh, that would give them a muscular tail that would, you could also have it have like a gripper on the end, you know, like spines that help hook into the bark. Oh yeah. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. As a, as sort of a latching. Yep. Yep. Because we see that with when spider monkeys have a pad on their tail, mm -hmm. that's a palm. They have a palm on their tail for grabbing the branches. You also see various animals that will use structures kind of like that during mating mm -hmm. to hold on yes. to the mate. Like sharks have their claspers and various animals have this sort of holding on structure. And if you have a structure that is already being selected for some sort of mating reproductive purpose... You could easily see a selective pressure for it to be used both mm -hmm. in combat yep, and then in the actual process for, like, keeping the mate close by, especially if you're hanging on it in a tree. Yes. And, you know, you want to help anchor each other so you don't fall off. So you could just, you could see a couple of wyverns up in a tree, males whipping each other, trying to yeah. establish this is their tree. And this, this sort of gives us a little evolutionary excuse. This is something that comes up a lot in Spooky. That when we are, whenever we talk about evolution, the features of an organism are the result of the function of those features yep. and the ancestry. Yes, that had to come from some structure that they already had, and then it has to have a reason that it is being selected. There has to be a yes. use, a purpose that is good for them. So a trick that we use to cheat a lot in Spooky is to come up with a prior function mm -hmm. that gives us an excuse for this otherwise kind of silly or inefficient thing yep yep if we have these early pterosaurs that developed stronger more functional tails to the point that even as they got bigger and developed these head crests those tails stuck around yeah, if, well especially if the mating like even if now you are walking different and serving a different role you know you're uh, filling a different niche within the ecosystem but if your mating behavior has stuck around a bit more like mm -hmm. you males still line up next to each other and whip each other even when you're the size of a giraffe yes <laughs> you're still doing it that way because that's just ancestrally that was where it came from and it, it never stopped you from doing all the other things so you kept like maybe they're probably not as prominent as the smaller ones yeah you, know, you, might, you might have shortened the tail some but if you still have this more notable still somewhat muscular tail that is part of your mating behavior and then we have them. And then we just say, all right, great. And then all the selective pressures that gave us the big Ashdarkid pterosaurs. Yep. Like Amborgiania and Quetzalcoatlus that have these big muscular bodies with big heads that have retained teeth. Mm -hmm. In addition to these long, muscular, maybe spined tails. That's a very cool angle on giving us basically all the pieces of a wyvern. Now, it would mean that, interestingly, even though in Dragon Slayer, Vermithrax was inspired by pterosaurs, at that size, from what from our reconstructions nowadays with big pterosaurs, they don't walk like our movie wyverns. Right, they don't crawl around. Because yeah, that's very much bat that's movement. That's how, like, vampire bats. Exactly, that's how that. a bat moves around. Even And it's even still different, because very often when we have movie pterosaurs, their wings are still unfurled and stretching out behind them. Right. Which looks awesome, but bats just fold their wings up completely. Right. And it's likely that pterosaurs were doing something similar. And pterosaurs are also walking in a much more upright. Exactly. More like dinosaurs. Yep. With their limbs underneath the body. So this would be a much taller wyvern than you typically would picture a wyvern being. Yeah. Uh, which is very interesting. Uh, the smaller ones, I, I assume, could probably would be moving more bat-esque, especially if you're climbing trees. Yeah. Uh, so if they got stuck on the ground, they would probably be moving... Like a movie of wyvern. Maybe. Although, archosaurs, generally this group often That's true. does have limbs farther under the body. Well, and, and so they, it they is could a have feature done a with some groups that they can transition between sprawling and... Yep, like crocs. Mm -hmm. So I imagine climbing would have looked a lot yep. like bats. But yeah, on the ground, maybe they were walking like little tiny giraffes. Which could also potentially make them much more mobile. Like, we're not mm -hmm. sure exactly how mobile pterosaurs were, but the stance they have... Seems like it was likely a more efficient walking posture than bats, where mm -hmm. you're, you know, a bat's feet are backwards for hanging on to stuff. Bats are not extremely well designed for walking around. Like that's, they are a bit more awkward. They're ones who are good at it. Pterosaurs potentially could have been very good on their feet. Yeah. So you might have had much more mobile wyverns 
that were still able to be perfectly functional while not flying. Yeah. Incidentally, this also gives us fuzzy wyverns. Yes, it does. Because pterosaurs had little fibers. Yep, yep. Little picno fibers. Yep. Uh, which is a very fun, I like that thought. Mm -hmm. And that could even be an origin of, like, the spines. Oh, yeah. They could be scales, mm -hmm. or they could be these fibers that have developed into these sharper, larger structures, like, yeah. like Almost, quills. I was about to say, more quill-esque, absolutely. Uh, which is a very nice connection to, like, the stinging tail, if we want to lean further toward that. that mm -hmm. they, they could have actually been kind of quill-esque and, like... No, no, I, I whip you with these sharp hairs, and hopefully that teaches you to leave me alone. Very cool. I like it a lot. Would they have any sort of mouth-based defensive would mechanism? Some sort of projectile? Breathe fire. Would they spit hmm. out their organ like a camel Right, does? right, right. <laughs> they, they vomit their, their respiratory system like a sea cucumber. <laughs> I did have the thought when, when going through the notes that... There are projectile defense systems. Birds will have that where they will vomit from their crop gastrointestinal sure, sure. stuff onto enemies and predators. And if it's another bird, it can ruin their feathers. Yeah, that's the same basic thing that camels do. Yep. Spit up their stomach contents. And so, like, projectile vomiting is definitely a thing. Absolutely. The So, the you know, the issue we run into here, listeners, is that... Producing actual flame is just not, that's just not. It's a very difficult and also extremely dangerous thing yes, to do. Because A, dragons are magically also immune to their own fire. Right. Like, <laughs> there's no organism that we know of can just be like, yeah, flame, open flame. You know, that that's just, there's not an animal that can do that. It also has the difficulty of like, why would, what, why would you be producing flame? fire right to cook your food yeah. before you eat it well and, and i think that I, all those different explanations that you went over with the multiple mm -hmm. chambers and the cha those are i think a lot of those are really cool oh yeah ideas that pull uh examples from the real world flight of dragons is one of my like the the animated film if you've never seen it it's super weird and quirky but that scene where they go over it is super satisfying because they just it is a scientist in a dragon's body learning from other, another dragon what he has to do to breathe fire and breaking it down and going, well, that's limestone. That's not firestone. Mm -hmm. So chemically, what does that mean? And breaking it down. It's super satisfying, but not actually practical. Yeah. And I guess you could come up with a, an evolutionary pathway for incorporating metals or mm -hmm. things into mm -hmm. your, your teeth. Archosaurs are known for swallowing stones. Yep, yep. That's a thing that crocodilians and birds do. Yes, you can absolutely have a, a crop for, for that sort of stuff, a craw. There are certainly chemical defenses that animals can develop. Like you said, spitting stuff up. Mm -hmm. There are animals that spit venom. Yep, like yep. That Those are all perfectly sort of reasonable real world things. Probably a more realistic real world take would be for it to be something like spitting as a defense mechanism. Or, even, I mean, regurgitating yep. is a thing that birds do. I think we have at least, I think we might have pterosaur regurgitolites. Yes, I believe so. I think that's come up in the news before. And I like that because flame is difficult. That's just, biology and flame do not actually go well together. No, they don't, they don't go together very well. Nope. And... Even the bombardier beetle, I can't figure out a way to make that come from the pterosaur's mouth. That makes sense. That's a tough, that's a tough angle. That's a very close range defense for the bombardier beetle. It's also, the way insects can do stuff like that with chemistry and vertebrates tend to do stuff with chemistry. That, that, that's a very insect <laughs> form of defense. Vertebrates just don't tend to do that kind of stuff. It's not that we couldn't, I suppose, but it feels very, very outside of the typical mm -hmm. vertebrate realm of, of reasonability. Here are some thoughts. Here, I thought, one thought is that what they're spitting up could just happen to be flammable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That it's something that easily, you know, people can collect it and then it works as a little, you throw it in your fire mm -hmm. or something. Also, we did use this explanation once in a previous spooky. A long time fans can identify it. It could be a mouth display. Yep, yep that you have color within the mouth that gives off the idea of fire. We talked in the European Dragons episode about the idea of them being associated with fire. 
that maybe they live in places that commonly get forest fires or heck, if we're, we're pulling on uh, prehistoric tropes, they can live near volcanoes. Right, right. And build up that sort of mythological association with fire. See, I, and I and I I like all that. I do think I really like like regurgitating bile and stomach acid. I do like that. I think that's a very cool because like angle. There's so many animals that do that. Yes, that is super common. It is acid breathing dragons. Absolutely, which, which is extremely cool. That's very D and D, and it still has the effect, the satisfying. Like, one of the things I always come back to when we come across one of those, like I don't know that we can really do this. Mm-hmm. But how would someone describe it if it happened to them? Yes. And it breathed on me and it burned. Yes. <laughs> if you hear that at the pub, you're not going to be like, what What do you mean burning? Chemically or, you know. Right. Do the, no. You should, and it burned him with it its burned, breath. Burned, burning breath. And five pubs later, now it is fire breathing. Which I do like that as an origin. I also like it because it means that our pterosaur, our wyvern, has horns for display Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for intimidation or for attracting mates it's got the tail that's used in combat and then potentially in defensive methods also it's got this last ditch throw up on something like that's disturbing me defense and i like the idea that so much of these structures are built around how these organisms interact with other organisms. Yes, yes. These are defensive and offensive structures, which leans very nicely into that mythos of the wyverns. So, like, yeah, this is a dangerous animal. Mm-hmm. Even though it's a pterosaur, right? Yeah. This isn't like, they're not hunting people. No, like you, you, if you give it a nice hard sh- shove in the shoulder, you probably do some damage. Right. <laughs> they're made out of balsa wood. But they're big and they've got all these different techniques that they can use to ward off potential offenders Mm -hmm. which is very cool i i I like the the bile spitting as an angle for that i think that's really fun well i I like the idea that they they just are intimidating animals even if they couldn't actually back that up Uh, i know i haven't we haven't watched it yet but the the prehistoric planet 2 there's a scene that's been going around the internet of a bunch of quetzalcoatlus chasing away a, a, a tyrannosaurus from like a kill mm-hmm. by just outnumbering and badgering and being yeah. and it's like yeah that can work like if i'm just uncomfortable enough and just make you go i i'm pretty sure you can't really hurt me but you're tall and you're loud and it. you're got these bright colors on your head and you keep you smell bad because you vomit at me <laughs> like mm, ah, also, i'm gonna leave the notion of our wyverns being uh, for sure, effective hunters, but if they also scavenge, mm-hmm. if they like vultures or hyenas where they can hunt, but they're also good at scavenging, if they're good at scaring away other predators, yes. leading to the fact that when people who are coming up with the mythology encounter them, they are often gathered around the body of a big animal. Yes. And they're, oh, it killed that elephant, and I oh, let's get out of here. Even though, well, what they actually did was they scared away all the lions and stuff yep. that took this thing down. Yep, yep. I, like I think that. that is a very cool. And pterosaurs came in all sorts of different ranges of sizes. Yes, that's what I was about to say. Yep. And so this would be uh, in this imagining a basal lineage, an mm-hmm. early lineage of pterosaurs that retained a lot of those early features: the teeth, the long tails using the tails for some an offensive combat strategy, developing those large sizes and a penchant for hunting and scavenging that would have either lived alongside or taken the place of ecologically those big, big later groups of pterosaurs and then persisted into our modern age where mm-hmm. people can then uh, sh- spread stories about them. Another thing that I like about this that's just a little, this is just fun for me, a lot of the best pterosaur fossils are known from Europe. Yeah. Which is just, it's very fitting, yep. especially early pterosaurs. Yep, yep. That's quite nice. I like that. Man, I wonder, because I was thinking about the wings, because like the one thing, just standard pterosaur wing, won't look like a wyvern wing because it only has the one digit. It's just the one membrane. But, and I mean, th- this might be, maybe this is reaching. I don't see any reason why other of the digits couldn't be added to the wing. like Well, and I would even, I, I think you could do that. I would even add that 
multiple flying vertebrates have developed those extra strut Yeah, bones. those styluses, yeah. Uh, you mentioned it with mm-hmm. Scansoriopter ridges. Uh, bats have yep. structures like that. I think some birds might have structures like that. So even if it's not the other fingers, you could develop these extra struts in the wing. Yeah. So you could get that something that would allow you to have the claws and the multi part The slightly wings. more batty wings. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I used to do that when I would draw dragons and I would give them a strut off the elbow just because it was nice to break up the dragon wing every yep. now and then. And bats and the dinosaurs that did it, it's a strut off the wrist. Yep. So it's coming from the hand and yes. it looks like another finger. Yep, yep. Very cool. I am very happy. These are cool wyverns. I like yeah, our wyverns. With our pterosaur wyverns. Very neat. I, I, I like picturing the different like sizes of like small Ramphorhynchus dimorphodon mm-hmm. ones up to like Pteranodon size up to big as darked sized and like tall ones. Cause then you can, you can have like it, whether there are multiple lineages that made it, or just if you look back through the evolutionary history, you can watch wyverns slowly get bigger and bigger and bigger mm-hmm. and go through different proportions. Either way, it's, it's very satisfying. <laughs> yeah. And our wyverns would have uh, occupied the Mesozoic alongside our European dragons. Yep. Yep. So we would have had, and then, uh, you know, Maybe occasionally interacting with our East Asian dragons yep. off on the shoreline. Yeah. Very cool. As usual, listeners, if you have further thoughts, these are these are the thoughts we come up with in 20 minutes of conversation. Mm-hmm. If you have further thoughts, uh, join the conversation. Hop on the Discord. We've got the Spooky channel going uh, and our uh, social media and everything. Absolutely. If you would like to or are inspired to draw any fan art of our up chucking wyverns sometimes it happens and we always uh love to see it it. is so satisfying to get to actually see the monsters we've created in art form we welcome it you can send it to us via email you can send it over social media there is a section for it in the discord so please go there it is very it is a perfect place to share it and if you're comfortable with us posting it on our website please let us know and tell us how you'd like to be credited or tagged Thank you for joining us for this, the third episode of our Spooky Dragon series. There is one spooky episode left for October. Yeah, we got one more Saturday. So check in then to see what our next dragon is. And then in November on the 11th, uh, join us for the Spooky live stream. 3 p.m. Eastern. Check out our online presence for uh, the reminders of the details. So we'll see you next week. More dragons. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.